Good evening, everyone. My name is David Elwood, and I'm the dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces, and I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, this is an extraordinary moment as we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the uh, Mosavar Ramani Romani Center for Business and Government. And our, the title of our panel tonight, I think, is particularly apropos. It is, uh, is America working? What can business and government do? What business and government can do? It, it's obviously purposely ambiguous. Uh, there's a question about jobs and uh, employment. Are we talking about democracy? Are we talking about is capitalism working? All of those parts are a part of what's on the table today. So obviously, the economy is making a slow comeback. We get good news followed by bad news, followed by good news, and so forth. So the one set of questions has to do with what business and government can do to create uh, more jobs more effectively going forward. Um, but there's much more to cover, and we have spectacular panelists to do it. Before I introduce uh, Nina Easton, who will moderate and introduce the, the panel and introduce our guests, uh, I did want to mention a couple of things. If you go back 30 years, uh, basically in 1982, Ronald Reagan was president. Uh, he's in the second year of his presidency. The first CD player was sold in Japan, um, and the Dow Jones reached a high of 1,072. Um, much has changed since then, but not the need for business government engagement. Indeed, I would say every one of the most important public problems we face cross the boundaries between business, government, and civil society. Nothing could be more important than the things we're doing here. I want to mention first uh, Frank and Dini Wa, who are sitting right here. Uh, Frank uh, and Dini were absolutely instrumental in the founding of, the, uh, of this program uh, some 30 years ago. Uh, they have been also very, very instrumental in a whole set of things around collaborative governance, which is a, a set of strategies precisely designed to take the, the strengths of business uh, and the, the goals and, uh, the, the, of, of government and work collaborative together. He's also supported the Center for Business and Government's uh, directorship. Equally important is uh, Sharmin and Bijan Mostavar Romani. Bijan's right here. Uh, Bijan's actually a graduate of the Kennedy School. And eight years ago, he uh, made a major investment in this uh, program and the like. And so Bijan has been quite instrumental again in making this what it is today. Um, Bijan, we're enormously grateful for everything you've had to do. Uh, I'd also like to recognize four former directors uh, who are here, I believe. Uh, Dick Cavanaugh, where are you, Dick? He's not here. There, oh, he's right there in that, ta in that chair. You know, we're just, uh, Ira Jackson, who I've seen, is right there. Roger Porter, um, who is up on stage. Uh, and John Ruggie, who, uh, are you here, John? Okay, I'd like to recognize two uh, former directors who are here uh, and going forward. Uh, now let me talk, let me introduce Anna Easton, who is our moderator. She is an award-winning author, a columnist, and a TV commentator. She is Fortune Magazine's um, Washington, uh, Washington columnist and senior editor covering politics and economics in the nation's capital and the readership for a readership of more than five million. Her column appears regularly in the magazine and the, in the online version. She also serves as co-chair of the annual Fortune's Most po uh, Powerful Women Summit. For six years, she's been a regular panelist on Fox News Sunday and Special Report. She has appeared on NBC's Need the Press, CBS's Face the Nation, PBS's Washington Week in Review, and Charlie Rose. She's the author of the critically acclaimed Gang of Five, Leaders at the Center of the Conservancy, Conservative Ascendancy. Prior to joining Fortune, she won a number of national awards as LA Times writer, later served as Boston Globe's uh, Deputy Bureau Chief in Washington. So with no further ado, by the way, I should also mention she's a fellow at our very own uh, Institute of Politics here at the Kennedy School. So uh, native Californian, thanks very much. I appreciate the support. Uh, let me, Nina, take it over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, that, that's the lead, of course. I was honored to be a, uh, a fellow here at IOP last fall. Fabulous experience. Um, before that was a fellow at the Shorenstein Center. I feel a little bit like this is my home. So thank you. I'm honored to be back. Uh, it's opening day, and I can't believe that we got this crowd, even though, and how'd, how'd, they, how'd they do? Awesome. Okay, good sign. Well, we've, um, we've decided to take on a fairly minor subject here. Um, is America working? Uh, in the naysayer column, we have uh, lots to talk about. We have a struggling economy, of course, that still can't quite get off the ground. We have 
uh, Americans leaving the workforce at uh, historic rates, uh, just becoming discouraged, not looking for jobs. Uh, we have a federal government, as we know, that's sort of careen careening towards a uh, fiscal uh, insustainability, uh, which is a federal government that's become a, a largely a, an entitlement transfer system and is having trouble paying its bills, as we know. Um, in, the, in, the, in the more optimistic column, we've got uh, energy revolution uh, right around the corner. And then we have what I always say is sort of the, uh, the ugly contest in national economies in that we're the least ugly of any of the sad stories on the horizon. That's the good news. We've got a fabulous... Uh, panel here, the top notch to, uh, from this university to, um, to discuss these issues. Uh, Roger Porter. Roger, I always picture Roger like running in to teach his class, uh, which is riveting. If you've ever never sat in a Roger Porter class, you have to. Riveting, full of history and anecdotes from the White House from his years uh, as a top advisor at the Ford, Reagan, and uh, Bush administrations, first Bush administration. Um, and he's, uh, he's also Dunster's beloved housemaster. Um, going on down the line, Larry Summers. Now, most of you know Larry as I don't know, Treasury Secretary, Harvard President, um, the economic advisor that President Obama turned to when he was trying to turn the economy around. But actually, Larry has a new... Um, thing to add to his resume. He is the most cited mentor figure by Sheryl Sandberg in her book, Lean In. <laughs> we want to hear all about that. Next is Paula Dobriansky. And I, you know, it's interesting, among them, she's got many accomplishments. And it's, it, it fills two pages. But I, what I wanted to mention is that she was Under Secretary of State for Democracy and Global Affairs for eight years under President Bush. And it was a position that not only put her at the center of where America's heading in the global economy, but helped her shape where America was going in the global economy. And finally, and not the least, we have Ben Heineman. Ben understands business from the inside out. He's been at GE for 18 years. He retired in 2005 after serving as senior vice president for law and public affairs. Former Rhodes Scholar, a senior fellow at the Harvard Law School and Golfer Center, and uh, welcome to you all. It's great to have you here. We are going to take questions halfway through, so start thinking about them. But I first wanted to go down the line and get general comments on where is America historically and what are your greatest concerns. Roger, start us off. Well, if you go back 30 years, and I think that's a, a good moment in time in which to go back. There are a number of reasons to be cautiously optimistic. If you look at what's happened over that period of time to the global trading system, uh, the United States, through its leadership under Republican and Democratic administrations, has helped to put into place a new international trading regime, which is working much better than it was in the past. We just finished what might be called a stress test in which with the economies going into recession around the world, we didn't follow the pattern that occurred in the 1930s. And in fact, there was no change in tariff rates between 2008 and 2009. And yet I, there were a lot of fears at the time that there were. A lot of fears at the time that that would happen. If you look at the world of regulation over the last 30 years, um, under both Democratic and Republican administrations, we have deregulated transportation, energy, uh, telecommunications. We've had a lot of economic deregulation that has benefited the economy. At the same time, we've had a huge explosion in social value regulation, dealing with health, safety, the environment, etc. And we have adopted benefit-cost analysis through some good work uh, of people at the Kennedy School and elsewhere to try to make regulations more commensurate with what their costs and benefits are. The problem here, or one of the problems here, is that we have a regulatory system that is very complicated. Cass Sunstein at the law school just got back from having run the Office of Information and Regulatory Analysis at OMB, which helps to oversee this, and he's finished a book called Simpler, uh, The Future of Government. 
and its essential point is we've got too complicated a regulatory system, and to summarize his book in a sentence, uh, we can do better by making it easier. And is that holding back economic growth in your mind? Uh, I think it is contributing to reluctance and hesitance on the part of, of many people. For example, uh, well, I, I want to give others uh, an opportunity, and I'll save that example for later, but the short answer is yes. Let me get to the concern, the biggest concerns that I have. If you look at fiscal and monetary policy over this last 30 years, and Larry and I have had the opportunity of being uh, in the White House 30 years ago, no one would have dreamt, having gone through the experience we did in the 1970s of two bouts of double-digit inflation, that we would have had essentially 30 years of low single-digit inflation. I think that is one of the great underappreciated accomplishments of the last three decades. However, if you look on the fiscal side of the budget, we've got three big problems. One, we've got a huge imbalance between revenues and expenditures. And that imbalance is now very large, and we've had it now for four years going on, and the prospects of getting it under control are not good, in part because it's being driven by demographic forces and demography is the future that's already happened. Secondly, if you look at the patterns of government spending, we've gone from a period in which 70% of the federal government's budget was discretionary went through the appropriations process, and we could decide how we want to spend it, to now a budget which is dominated by mandatory or entitlement spending. And so we have lost the flexibility to use the spending we do as a government in the ways that are going to benefit us and future generations the most. In investments in infrastructure and exactly. so on. But let me go. Uh, let, and and let, me, let me raise one other yeah. question, and that's what's happened to our tax code. Because once again, we've gotten a great deal more complexity in our tax code now. Mm -hmm. uh, we've added, according to the, uh, uh, the Joint Committee on Internal Taxation, we've gone from tax expenditures of less than 100 to more than 250. We've added more than 3,000 provisions in the tax code just in the last 10 years. There is virtually no one who has examined our tax code who believes that it is serving us well with respect to allowing us to efficiently allocate our sources the way that we want. And the problem is that there, I think there is widespread agreement that we have a problem here, but we don't seem to have a set of political institutions that are stepping up to the plate and addressing or solving that problem. The last time we had major fundamental tax reform was in 1986, and we've now gone more than a quarter of a century since then without it, and we need it. Larry, how sick is the patient of America, and um, could you address some of Roger's concerns, particularly the fact that uh, the, the, um, the government, because of entitlements, lacks the ability to invest in ways that would boost the economy for the future? Look, uh, adjusting for the fact that he's a Republican and I'm a Democrat, so we frame things in somewhat different ways, I broadly agree with uh, the things that Roger said. But I would say I would emphasize two other things. First, positive thing. If you take uh, the John Rawls view of this, if I could imagine being born a random individual into any country in the world, I would choose the United States right now. And if I could choose, if I could imagine being born as a random individual into the United States at any point in the present or past, I would choose the present. And if I could choose being born 10 years from now, I would choose being born 10 years from now. So I think we have to take that perspective as we approach any of this set of problems. Having said that, 
look, the budget deficit, the tax reform, the entitlements, the regulation, those are all means to an end. If you want to worry about something, there's really only one important domestic economic thing to worry about. And that is that for 200 years, it has been a reasonable assumption for the vast majority of Americans that their children were going to live more comfortable, better lives than they did. And that at this moment, that proposition is in doubt among a large number of our fellow citizens. And it is in doubt for a combination of reasons. It is in doubt because the overall rate of trend economic growth appears to have slowed for some variety of reasons that Dale Jorgensen, who's here tonight, could illuminate us on. It is in doubt because the level of inequality and more serious, the level of social mobility has deteriorated substantially. In the vast majority of respects, America has made great progress. But stunningly, the gap in in ability to go to a good college between rich people and poor people was smaller when the Business and Government Center was founded than it is today. And it should not be that way. And so there is a decline in terms of social, all kinds of aspects of social mobility, which affects the prospects of children. There is a decline of a kind that people at the school study in many parts of the population in the likelihood that those children will be brought up in a happy, full, and loving family over the last eras in America. The timing may be slightly uh, different, but that is a concern. There is the greater risk that Dan Schrag could tell us about in great detail of environmental trouble or pandemic trouble really affecting children's lives in a way that was not the case 40 years ago, as distinct from a local environmental uh, problem. So there is plenty for us to work on. I believe these problems are surmountable. I'm quite confident of that. I actually think there's a quite good chance that they will be surmounted. And I think that part of what we need is a little more faith in ourselves and optimism in terms of our ability to overcome them. But I would suggest as the central question regarding whether America is working, it is can most parents reasonably expect that their children will live better lives? And what worries me most is that that's a more debatable proposition today than it has been at many moments in the past. And I want to stick on this point just for one moment and go to Ben and back to Paula, the inequality issue, because, you know, I think Larry's right. Social mobility in particular, it's not just about the rich getting richer. It's about median income men in this country whose earnings have declined over the past 30 years, um, whose educational attainment is at an ebb, uh, who are dropping out of the workforce at record uh, rates. Can you talk about that and talk about the private sector role, if any, moving forward on that? Yeah, I'm going to jump back. I'm going to jump back to Paul on a slightly different issue. But go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the problem is that uh, if you're talking about people who are involved in the global competition in that kind of world, the people who've fallen behind, as Larry has talked about, there may not be jobs in the United States for, in the global competitive world for these people, and that whether we have Corporations can do more by way of training, uh, can do more uh, by way of supporting education, uh, remains to be seen. But I think that some of these jobs that have been lost will never come back due to either product, uh, productivity gains or just a fundamental shifts in the way global competition is going forward. 
Um, and so I think since we're in a global economy, and if you looked at the Fortune 100 company, I would say that probably most of them have half of their sales, half of their profits, and probably half of their workforce offshore, uh, it's going to be very hard to bring these bring jobs back. It won't happen. Um, the renaissance of manufacturing is still going to be very, very, very small in this country. It's about 11% now, down from 20 or 22% 30 years ago. Bureau of Labor Statistics says in 2020, 7% of the jobs in the United States will be manufacturing. So we have a tremendous change for some of the reasons that Larry said, and I think for the changing nature of global competition that's going to affect certainly at the high end of, uh, of the business community. And you, you study in corporate governance and so forth. Does that, how does that fit in how America is doing well, I think, right now? I think the long and short of it is that the trust in business has never been lower. That if you go back to Enron, WorldCom, stock options, and then I consider BP and Siemens to be sort of American because huge amounts of their business are in America. I mean, these are now all global uh, companies, Walmart, whatever, uh, uh, and then the financial meltdown. Uh, the trust in corporations is at an all-time low, uh, just in terms of Pew surveys and things like that. The fundamental purpose of the corporation, in my judgment, is high performance with high integrity and then having risk management both on the financial side and on the integrity side. Integrity is law, ethics, and values. And I think we've gone through a period where there have been very vivid cases where this has not happened. And on the business side, uh, the financial meltdown, we can have an argument, but I happen to believe it was caused primarily by misallocation of capital among finan big financial institutions. There are many other causes. We lacked a person from the financial community to stand up and speak about what the mistakes were and what needed to be done in Washington. Instead, there was a lot of naysaying about Dodd-Frank, which parts of it no, no doubt deserve. But I think we're lacking in statesmanship uh, on both the performance side and what does it mean to have good performance and how do we explain that to the American people and certainly on the integrity side, uh, where we have lots of cases of violations of law, either negligence, recklessness, or even intentional acts. And so the, it's always the best of times and the worst of times. Of course, there are companies who are doing wonderful things. But I think in terms of the perception, the capability of business to be influential in the society is now in Washington in lobbying groups on K Street. They don't, business people do not speak to the country, are not effective in a way that they might have been after the Second World War, when there was a different uh, type of person who was running corporations. We've moved, at least the historians would say, from basically what is called managerial capitalism, evidenced by a man named Owen Young at GE in the 20s, who said he had a fiduciary duty not just to the shareholders, but to all the constituents of the corporation and society, to what's called investor capitalism, where, at least until recently, in the changing debate, uh, the shareholder has been preeminent. And so there are a lot of issues about trust and statesmanship and politics, I think, uh, where the corporations have found themselves in a difficult uh, situation. And I guess one last comment. In my view, integrity involves the ethics. That is both what you agree to do yourself beyond what the law requires, but it also involves public policy. What are your positions on public policy? Those are voluntary positions you can take about changing the rules. And I think, uh, again, uh, corporations have very little credibility right now um, on this. They're viewed as extremely self-interested. We're awash in money and lobbying, and the political system has great difficulties, which we can discuss in greater detail. But I would put the fracturing of the political system, in part due to corporate money, by no means only due to corporate money, many other reasons as well, as the kinds of problems we're dealing with. So I think the lack of trust and the lack of, of statesmanship in the business community is another serious problem compared to times past. So, Paula, you've seen some good news on the, at least on the uh, private-public partnership front over these this recent decade. Um, talk about that, but also where you see us now. Right. Let me, before I uh, address the public-private partnerships, let me make a comment that's a little bit different from the uh, comments made thus far on the issue of historical context. Two trends that I think are significant in a policy sense and looking outward. One is America's own self-assessment. And when you look at public opinion and polls of where and what we think of ourselves, unfortunately, it has gone down. And particularly in terms of our overall confidence in taking steps abroad. 
there's been a movement that I think has been unfortunate because of these internal developments. And there's a second piece, and it's not just the self-assessment, but the second piece is how other countries abroad are looking at us. And one of the statements last year that really stuck in my mind was when Ahmadinejad of Iran came forth and said, we don't need to be concerned about the United States because it has this trillion dollar debt and its power base has been diminished. I put it forward just because the other issue is public perceptions, whether it's the case or not the case. And this goes to the trend which was very striking to me. Actually, in terms of power projections, how we're perceived, the whole question of economics has really come to the forefront. I would say that years ago, I don't think that was always, always so front and center in terms of the overall assessment of our power base. So having said that, let me go to public-private partnerships. I think that one of the good news stories, in fact, is how the US government in many different quarters has developed public-private partnerships. I remember decades ago, there were actually being a tremendous inhibition of, no, we don't want to do that. Why would we want to share any kind of our policy access to any entity outside, be it a, a corporation or be it a non-governmental organization or other? And now, the striking thing is, is that you have these public-private partnerships which have really grown by leaps and bounds, and in many critical sectors the health sector, the energy sector, even just basic humanitarian assistance. And let me give you a couple of quick examples. In the health area, I think many of you, I'm sure, remember that uh, during the time of apartheid in South Africa, well, Coca-Cola was in there. I don't believe it was by that name, but it was in there, and it had an infrastructure of distribution of Coca-Cola. Well, you know that distribution system was well tapped into for dealing with HIV AIDS and getting antiretrovirals very quickly into many communities. Uh, looking at avian influenza, not speaking about right now in the reports coming out of China, but just a few years ago when we were dealing with the bout of avian influenza. I remember quite graphically there being a major meeting in Singapore held by the US Chamber of Commerce in tandem with the, uh, the resident chamber Massive, I mean, the room was just packed with corporations. These corporations had a tremendous impact in terms of the government cooperation. They were way ahead of the curve in establishing a blueprint for action for dealing with the impact of avian influenza and then what it would mean for the workforce. Americans working abroad and what impact it would have, how we would deal with getting assistance to those Americans. These are just a few examples. There are government funds that never existed before, at least in my time, and I've been in government for a long time, over from administration to administration. And I remember that just recently, the lawyers in the State Department uh, had set up uh, some funds where monies could be funneled to provide assistance for cru crucial areas that could be a drawdown, like the refugee area. There's now a refugee fund at the State Department, never existed before. Basically, monies go in from corporations, from other private entities, and basically those monies are used for very practical purposes. So in sum, I just say that this is a trend that I think is a very good one, a very positive one, and actually one that even though, uh, as Ben said, that maybe the overall uh, public opinion polling of corporations maybe has gone down, I think that this is a sector where they've been doing really good work, crucial work, and that's had a good impact. And I, I want to throw it to Larry in a second, but I would just add that, I mean, it's interesting that companies like Coca-Cola, like Walmart, are investing in women entrepreneurs overseas, by the way, in a big way, and including them in their supply chain. You know, they've, they've set goals to train millions of women as entrepreneurs in, develop, in the developing world. Um, and you go to places like Davos, and you do hear CEOs talk like they care about the world and they want to do something, and they're looking at ways. I, I don't see that here as much, I have to say. And this is, I want to bring Larry in on this and others, other issues, but I don't see that for job training, for example. The GAO has, has shown that job training federal programs are broken. I don't see companies coming in and to the rescue on that. If the government maxed out here, 
where are the business leaders? Um, but Larry, you wanted to jump in. I want to be provocative for a second. Um, Shocking. Look, um, there are a variety of examples where the public and private sector have worked together to do very important things. The research program that Frank Wilde has simulated, uh, stimulated on collaborative governance gives a variety of examples, and it can be a very powerful modality. Having said that, when I hear people talk about public and private partnership, I reach for my wallet. Let me tell you about some of the major public-private partnerships in American history. No company has used the word public-private partnership as frequently as Fannie Mae, unless it's Freddie Mac. <laughs> the whole thing was public-private collaborative, was really super collaborative. The government appointed the board. The government guaranteed the debt. It set low-income goals. There was a massive collaboration, massive disaster. The nuclear power industry. From the beginning, public-private collaboration. From the beginning, hundreds of billions of dollars dissipated. Sin fuels. Public-private collaboration. Tens of billions of dollars in. Precious little out. The defense contracting industry, not public-private cooperation, absolutely, people moving back and forth between the two sectors, former officials on the board, constant discussion of the collaboration, not known for its spectacular efficiency over the last 50 years. Go, Ben got it right when he said that somehow risk management in the financial system does not appear to have been a triumphant success over the last decade. But on both sides, massive discussion of collaboration between the companies and their regulators as part of the financial community. Whenever I hear the word community used to refer to a bunch of people from the government and a bunch of people from industry working together, I have a sense that it's not going to end well. <laughs> and, you know, I have a very simple kind of criterion for looking at these things, which is looking at these partnerships, which is you go to a meeting about the partnership with a company and you ask to speak to the most three, three most senior people involved in the partnership, is one of them involved in public affairs? And if the answer is no, that's a really good sign. <laughs> and if the answer is yes, you should be a little nervous that the motive is a kind of broad institutional advertising. So look, there's certainly examples that, that, that work and all of that. Frankly, it doesn't make me feel good. And I know this is a complicated question. When I hear that a portion of the U.S. government is raising funds from wealthy people who are interested and having events with very senior officials where they're celebrated and naming things after them to perform basic public functions, kind of like we do at a university when we raise funds. When I hear that the federal government of the United States is doing that, I don't actually feel so good that that's like a great way for a country that prides itself on equality to do it. So, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff to do, but I think, like, respectful carrying out your respective and very different roles is a different and important part of a proper relationship between business and government. I think Roger and I are sitting here trying to not use the word Solyndra, but we're going to go to um, Paula and Ben, both on, on this subject. I see, it, I see it differently, as I've suggested. That doesn't mean that public-private partnerships are all perfect or all a panacea. But we're talking about historical context. And I would say, certainly in the context of foreign policy, that in this context that corporations have had an important role. And by the way, I repeat, again, that doesn't mean that every case is perfect. 
Nina, you mentioned yourself about uh, whether it be at Walmart. I know Kate Spade has been involved. Um, there are a number of corporations that have taken upon themselves to provide training, particularly for countries where women have been at a disadvantage. And I have to tell you, I think that investment has gone a long way, and there have been measurable results. I haven't trembled about their putting their hands in their pockets to actually do this, because I've seen the impact, the results, and that there have been positive consequences. To me, this panel, when you're talking about making America work, I'm looking at not only what's going on here at home, but also, as I suggested, how we are perceived abroad. But let me give another example, the energy area. I can give you quite a few examples of where the collaboration between the U.S. government and the private sector, it's been advantageous. By the way, because we've been able to sift through what may not work and what may work. There was an investment in carbon sequestration, for example, in which a number of countries came forward. It's an expensive enterprise. Many are not going on that path. There is hydrogen, looking at hydrogen economies, what works, what doesn't work, same thing. There are many who have invested that in that. It's not a path that we're going down. Lots of investment in energy efficiency, in renewable energies. So just as many, there may be some uh, situations that have not gone forward smoothly, I could argue that there are just as many that have had a very good and very positive impact. In other words, it's not a panacea, but it's an element of a trend that has changed in the last decades. Ben? Um, I tend to agree with Larry in this sense. I think one of the great issues that we face is international competitiveness. That's going to be true for the rest of the century, obviously. The problem is every government has its thumb on the scale in some way or in the other. We can go from China or Russia uh, or the, some of the Gulf states in terms of really uh, both licit and illicit activities to support uh, their economic system and their corporations, quote unquote, uh, to sort of uh, the United States, which may be more open and more free market. But there are tons of preferences and subsidies and various things in the tax code and elsewhere. The goal, obviously, should, if we can define it, and I think we could, we should have global competition as the place we end point we ought to be by 2050. But at the moment, we don't have anything like that because of the roles that governments all across the, country, the, the world play. And I think the dilemma that we face is what can we do to be more competitive in that kind of context? We can clearly do some general things, education, R&D, infrastructure, that are general goods for the society and will help international competition. Um, we can do things in the trade area, clearly opening markets and uh, a whole variety of things. But when we start making preferences for companies of one sort or another, we start to run a terrible risk that we are going to have crony capitalism in this country just as it exists around the world. And I think that's something that we have to be very mindful of. I think we are facing a great dilemma of what can we do with respect to individual industries or companies as opposed to general infrastructure, those kinds of things, or general market opening activities. The third category, what do we do? There are 1.1 trillion tax, prep, tax expenditures, you know, according to uh, Simpson Bowles. Not all of those are corporate, but there are a lot. There are many other preferences and subsidies and so forth. So I think we face a great dilemma. I don't think we've had the right debate yet about how we uh, sort of deal with the fact that there is this incredible inequality in the nature of competition. We have an endpoint, but how do we navigate between the endpoint and the sort of disparate uh, circumstances that we have today? I think it's a very fundamental question facing society. We don't ever come close to talking about one last thing, if I might. I'm a moderate Democrat, well known. But I was stunned that President Obama and the State of the Union never talked about economic growth. I mean, the engine of this society has always been economic growth. Everything else depends on that. And so this very much is part of, uh, of, a, of a country uh, that can grow economically and to do other things that are necessary on the public good side. I'm going to bring Roger in, and then I'm going to swing to the audience. So if you want to start getting to the microphone, if you have a question, go ahead. Um, is crony capitalism a problem, A, B, on a different, slightly different subject, why aren't, why is corporate America not doing more to develop the workforce at home? Well, uh, I am 
just as opposed to crony capitalism as I sense everyone else on the stage is and that I suspect in the audience. And when government steps in and starts allocating to particular individuals or organizations, the, whoever this is, the prospects for corruption are very high. Uh, the concern that I have, and I, and I share the, the view that many of others, others have expressed, that we have a problem now with respect to a lack of confidence slash trust in our institutions. It's true in business. It's true in government. It's true virtually everywhere. Um, why is this? Well, there are obviously a large number of reasons, but a couple of them that strike me that I think are worth our reflecting on are the fact that if you look at great organizations, great societies, great individuals, they tend to have their focus tilted toward future investment rather than current consumption. They're not present-minded, but they're constantly thinking about how the things that they are doing today are going to affect their future and those others in the future. And right now, I think there's a, there's a really uh, marked angst among many Americans that we're not doing that, that we're not attending to things in the future, and that we're over-focused on the present. Second characteristic that tends to dominate great individuals, great institutions, and great organizations is that they are focused on dynamism, change, adjustment, and innovation rather than being focused on security, stability, and keeping things the way they are. The great teams are not the ones who are sitting on a lead but they're out on the frontier being innovative, dynamic, etc. Now, for a very long period of time, I think you could make a compelling argument that the United States, among all countries in the world, excelled in both of those dimensions. The question that it seems to me we face is, is that true today? And if you look at the way in which many of our institutions are operating today, this is why I was trying to, in my first round of remarks, talk about the need to make things more simple and less complicated than they are right now. Because the thing that is going to give us the kind of economic growth that we would all like is if we embrace the pattern of investments that we need to make in the future and if we embrace this culture of dynamism, change, adjustment, and innovation. One of the reasons that many of us love this university and have devoted our professional lives to it is because it is, by and large, one of those institutions that is always thinking about the future and that is always looking for ways to being dynamic, innovative, and creative. And that needs to be the mantra, I think, for both business and government if we're going to succeed. Great. Now we're going to go to the audience. Um, guidelines, please identify yourself and your affiliation. One brief question, please, and that question must end in a question mark. The young man right here. You're on. Hello. My name is Regina Flores, and I'm a senior at Altoona Area High School in Pennsylvania. And I'm considering coming to Harvard Extension School this, uh, this coming fall. My question is for Dr. Sumners. In your first statement, you said that America is now at risk of pandemics more than it was 40 years ago. I was just wondering how you can say something like that. <laughs> I, think I, 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 I think I referred uh, to pandemics or... Uh, environmental catastrophes. And I, what I had in mind was a combination of the rise of global climate change, um, which poses very severe uh, risks that we're seeing uh, in the greater frequency of storms 
uh, and the like. And I had in mind uh, the substantially greater transmissibility of um, adverse biological elements that uh, are made possible by the phenomena associated with globalization. And I think if you read the relevant unclassified uh, literature, you'll find that it would generally share um, my assessment that as a risk sometime over the next 50 years, those risks have increased. Gentleman right here. My name is Sean Rush. I'm an MPA from here at the Kennedy School. Uh, uh, basic question. Let me reframe the topic of tonight's discussion from is America working to is America's government working? Uh, we've heard a lot about the success or failure of public-private partnerships, uh, business working with government, yet we've seen nothing but gridlock and look forward to nothing more than that for the next few years. Can America's government work? I'll jump well, in on that one. I, I think you're quite right to put that out there. Um, I, I obviously feel that public-private partnerships and the government's role with business is advancing. Um, in the other area, you know, the executive branch and the legislative branch, uh, we're not seeing it uh, uh, tackle many of these critical issues that we're describing and discussing right here. And I think that there, that has to move forward. There has to be leadership. I wish that there was more leadership uh, on this issue, and I'll say it very objectively uh, from both ends of the uh, uh, spectrum on this one. And that's actually, if you had to pick out a change, actually most people going back, I think, because being here in Massachusetts, the time of Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, when Tip O'Neill was speaker, there was so much that they were on different sides of the aisle, different issues, but came together and worked issues, moved it forward. You raise an important issue that is essential for making America work. A different, a different panel, can, can sir. I give, can I give a different answer? Because I, I do think it's easy to be too negative, and this is really a bipartisan kind of, uh, kind of answer. Um, when September 11th happened, I was president. Of, I was during the time I was president of the university, and I asked the university's experts, people like Joe Nye and Graham Allison, um, what they thought the odds were that there would be another September 11th-like episode or one 10 or 100 times as bad with nuclear weapons in uh, the subsequent decade. And the answers different people gave me varied. But if you had said an episode of the size of September 11th, the answers I would have gotten would have been that in the next 12 years, oh, it was virtually certain that there would be such an episode somewhere. That hasn't happened. I don't think that's probably in part, in small part, that's because people were exaggerating the risk because they were caught up in the moment. But that's because on something very fundamental and important, government worked and did a good job. I think the fact that with all the problems, and there will be problems, Three years from now, we will be a country where very few people do not have access to health care because they can't afford health insurance. And we used to be a country where there were 50 million such people. I think that means government is working in ways that it didn't do before. So there's plenty to complain about. There's plenty that's wrong. But I, don't, I think the current tendency to regard the litmus test of the society as being whether an agreement is reached in the next six months about the future of Social Security that would in any event take place, that would in any event be implemented 10 years from now, I think the degree of fixation on that is excessive. That's not to say the cause isn't right, but I think the degree of fixation is excessive. The system is badly broken, there's too much money, but there is a difference of ideas about what the role of government is. We shouldn't neglect that. So part of the, the paralysis is people with really different visions of what the role of government is. Uh, you might want to read uh, Passage of Power, the, the Caro book about Johnson. For 25 years, according to the book, the Senate was stopped because the southern leadership of the committees stopped everything. And there was stasis in the government. 
you know, so to some extent, I think we have to have an argument about ideas somehow and bridge that gap in addition to all the other problems. We shouldn't neglect that. Okay, I'm going to um, exercise my moderator's prerogative and call on one of my favorite students, Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, I'm an international student. I'm from Israel, and I was just wondering if you guys think that the U.S. has a problem with immigration policy that, that is affecting its competitiveness, and should the Obama administration push for reform in that matter? Immigration policy, is it affecting our competitiveness? Yes. Yes, a lot. And the Obama administration is pushing, and it is uh, competitiveness policy, it is immigration policy broadly understood to go to everything at, that happens at uh, the border. The uh, hugely successful science student here uh, years ago whose father died uh, went back uh, for the funeral and was not able to come back for nine months and missed the chance to publish a very important paper. That was damaging to America's competitiveness in higher education, damaging to America's standing in the world, and damaging to America's ability more broadly uh, to recruit people of tremendous uh, talent. So yes, it, it should be, and I think it increasingly is, a bipartisan priority. Roger. It's important to distinguish between what is commonly referred to as illegal immigration and legal immigration, which I think is the thrust of your question. And if you look at what we have done with respect to legal immigration, we are way behind a large number of other countries, including Canada and Australia, that are encouraging people who want to come, who have good skills and can contribute dramatically to their economies. We now have businesses pleading for HB1 visas that get filled. The annual quota gets filled now in five days. Not 365 days, in five days. We are one of the premier countries in the world in producing educational institutions and drawing people from all over the world to come here and to study. And then we make it extraordinarily difficult for some of those who would like to stay and to contribute to do so. Now, I'm not suggesting that we ought to have a huge brain drain and drag everybody, all the talented people in the world here. We need to train people and send them back. But we are way behind what a large number of other countries are doing. And uh, I, I, I share Larry's view, if I understand it correctly, that this is a place where business and government Republicans and Democrats ought to be able to find some common ground. I would just add, okay, go ahead. I was just going to say on the last question, the gentleman asked about, you know, making uh, our government work. This is a key issue where government should work and can work. But it raises one other quick question. I don't mean to dominate, so go to a question. But, um, you know, why aren't companies doing more to train Americans for some of those jobs? Microsoft has 6,000 empty, vacant jobs a month mostly only need an undergraduate degree in computer science. Why, why, aren't, why aren't businesses doing more to train Americans to get there? But that's a different topic. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Jake Silberg. I'm a sophomore at Harvard College, and I will be asking the question on behalf of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Uh, what have business and government learned from the financial crisis? Uh, how has the relationship between business and government changed since the financial crisis? And have we made the type of progress that will prevent another financial crisis in the future? Larry? <laughs> We've learned um, a lot about a variety of mechanisms through which an apparently stable system can go critical and unstable much more rapidly than was, uh, than was generally imagined. We've responded to that learning with both legislation and regulatory action that tries to get at the principal mechanisms, whether it's the subsidies associated with too big to fail, 
whether it's inadequacies in the level of capital, whether it's invisibility and non-transparency with respect to derivatives, whether it's incentives problems associated with ratings and securitizations, and to try to get as many aspects of what went wrong as we could. And my expectation uh, would be that uh, the system is significantly safer than it would have been if none of those things had been done. I think at a different level, what financial accidents come from is the fact that when things feel safe and have been safe for a long time, people decide to take more risk in order to hopefully get more return, and then accidents start to happen. And so in the same way that automobile regulation, automobile safety regulation is enormously important and valuable, but nonetheless, there is a tendency for people to drive a little faster when you make the cars better, and so you have to be constantly vigilant. Those issues exist very much with respect to financial regulation, and I think the biggest mistake we could make is to somehow think that we had this crisis and we had a response, and so now we can relax. There's a need for constant vigilance and concern with respect to uh, new sources of uh, risk. But uh, I do think it's reasonable uh, to reach a judgment that, in part because of what's happened due to regulation, and in part, frankly, because of what's been learned from the experience. You know, the American financial system was remarkably stable through the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And part of the reason for that was that it was regulated in a variety of ways. But part of the reason for that was the lessons that had been taught by the Depression that induced a lot of private controls on risk-taking. Memories are shorter these days, and so it won't be nearly as long. But I think there is also that aspect that contributes uh, to stability uh, in uh, the years ahead. Ben? I think there's a fundamental question of whether the culture of the financial world of Wall Street has changed dramatically. Um, as I said in earlier uh, remarks, uh, there are institution, there are industry-wide problems from money laundering to LIBOR uh, to fraud uh, that continue. Whether they will be catastrophic or just big problems, I think, remains to be seen. Um, but I think the culture of greed and the entitlement that many of these people feel for excess compensation, I think, poses a great risk, and I don't think it's been particularly reined in. I'm not sure. It goes back to my point about private ordering. The government can't particularly do it. It has to be leadership and the changing of the cultures in these financial institutions, and I would worry about it, and I would just make the last point. If you look at the whale uh, issue and you read the reports, both the internal report of, uh, of, Morgan, of uh, J.P. Morgan and the Senate report, all the problems that existed that led up to the financial crisis were repeated two or three years after the crisis by supposedly the best risk manager on Wall Street, and he was personally uh, cognizant of what was going on. So I think that should give people some pause. Hi there, Jeremy Balkan uh, from the uh, Kennedy School World Economic Forum of Young Global Leaders. Uh, and thank you for allowing people like me and my colleagues to come from really far away and realize big dreams by being here. In the context of the gentleman's previous question about business and government leadership, are too many CEOs behaving like politicians and are, too, and are not enough politicians behaving like CEOs in the context of making decisions, being held accountable, and taking responsibility for them? Well... Uh, let, let me give you an example of a CEO um, seizing the leadership to deal with a difficult situation. This is when we went into the recession, 2008-2009. Demand for the particular product for this company declined by 50%. 
It's a company that uh, at the time had about 21,000 employees. And its stock plummeted, as you would expect, with uh, a circumstance in which the demand for your product's been cut in half. And it looked like it was going to have to lay off about 4,000 people to survive. People at the top in companies get paid with base pay, bonus, and long-term incentive compensation, much of which is in the form of options and uh, restricted shares, stock. The options were now all underwater. And midway through the year, the CEO came to that company's compensation committee and said, I would like to propose the following. One, we will declare right now that we will give no bonuses whatsoever this year. That means we can take the $10 million that has been accrued for those bonuses and put it back on our balance sheet. Number two, um, with respect to our base pay, I am going to take a 20% cut. The next 50 people in the company will take a 15% cut. And the next 21,000 people will take 10% cut. The board asked him, how long is this going to last? And he says, as long as it needs to and no longer. The board approved it. Now, it was a little complicated because you could do that in their U.S. operations, but it had a bunch of European operations. And in Europe, people sign contracts and say, you can't lower my salary without my permission. So he went over and convinced every employee they had in Europe, thousands of them, to sign this, that they would voluntarily have their pay cut. How long did it last? It lasted for almost a year. The company survived. They didn't make the layoffs of 4,000 people. The reason that he gave as to why they were doing this is because they believed in the company and they were all part of a group and they were going to save these 4,000 jobs. The company not only has survived well, it's come back nicely. It's actually grown in employment now. Its stock is back up. People are happy. But it certainly didn't look like that at the time. But he recognized that something bold and dramatic needed to be done. And he took the leadership of saying, I'm going to do more than I'm asking anyone else to do. And it worked. And it's that kind of leadership where you deal with reality. Not the world that you would like it to be, but the way the world is that we need to see in business and we need to see in government if we're going to have the flexibility and adaptability to shape the kind of future that we want to have. So Larry's going to ask President Obama to give up his Social Security payments as we do entitlement reform. Last question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alan Rawl. I'm an alumnus of the Kennedy School, and I'm uh, now a partner at Sidley Austin, where we're proud to claim Mr. Heineman as an alumnus. Um, my question is a different take on uh, whether government is working or not. There's uh, a lot of good discussion about how we're broken and dysfunctional and so on. But I would ask uh, the panel to consider whether uh, it's the government that's uh, broken or are we really getting the government that uh, suits the people just fine. Uh, Professor Porter talked about... Uh, a successful societies uh, kind of investing in the future and delaying gratification and so on. Uh, I, th- I would think that's a characteristic of the people as much uh, perhaps as of the government, and the government is a reflection of the people. Um, and do we need, my question is, do we need a leader to come along, perhaps like the namesake of, of the school, John F. Kennedy or Ronald Reagan, you know, it's morning in America to rise up our spirit, to change our spirit, to change the national zeitgeist, President Kennedy asking what you can do and so on. And uh, to to think about investment of the future, does it really take changing the character of the people that's become, let's say, not as uh, ideal as we would like? And if so, how do we go about doing that? Is that something Harvard can do, or does it uh, emanate from somewhere else? Paula? Well, I'll, I'll take it from three different directions. First, I think about a professor I had here, Samuel Huntington who wrote a book uh, about the IVI gap, ideals versus institutions. And he talked about the cyclical change where the American public 
became very disillusioned when the institutions didn't meet up to the ideals and what the expectation was. And that we would see this kind of cyclical gap that we would go through. So first, I'd make the point that, yes, I do think that public opinion matters. And I think that just by the sheer fact we're even having this discussion, it's, it's, it's crucial. Uh, American public opinion matters. It matters in terms of our politics. It matters in terms of innovation and change. It matters in the way in which we do business. So first, yes, on that. Secondly, on leadership, I, uh, I think your point is well taken. And the question before, yes, you have to have leadership in politics. You have to have leadership in business. And I, I was thinking that, you know, everyone thinks that there's a, a, a literally a kind of a jam between Republicans and Democrats. I think, and go back to the beginning of the first two years of the Obama administration, and a bit of the jam the executive branch was in with a democratically controlled Congress. So I put that forward because, again, this comes back to there are hard issues at hand here. I, I think it's not only about bipartisanship, but truly it is about really tackling some significant changes that are affecting the United States economically and where it's not just taking a small step here, a small step there. It is making some dramatic changes in the way in which we go forward and garnering public confidence, which I think is much lacking at this time. Unfortunately, we're out of time, unless you wanted to do something really quick, brief, two I'll, brief. I'll, I'll okay. try to do one really quickly. It's, it's probably true that there has never been a time in our history politically when we have had as responsive a democracy as we have now. Members of Congress spend far more time back in their districts talking with people. We now have over half of the staff of the House of Representatives and the federal government are located in the states rather than in Washington, D.C. Uh, if you look at what politicians look to, we've never had more polling done of electorates to try to figure out what people want. So in that sense, we're getting a lot of what we are asking for. What we need are elected officials, in my view, who are prepared to educate people as to what our real choices are. I am actually an optimist that if people understand what their real choices are, that they will come most of the time to the right conclusion. What we have now are often campaigns which do not illuminate what our real choices are. And candidates who get elected who are so eager to be responsive and so terrified of primary fights that they may have the next time around, that they are not doing what many of us think need to be done, but instead are responding in this, what Hugh Hecklow often refers to as our hyper-democracy. Larry? Sorry, I wish I can can be a little more optimistic. I hope my comments about parents and children convinced you that I relate to the seriousness and gravity of the problems we face right now. Having said that, I do think that some historical perspective is in order. In 1991, every single issue of the Harvard Business Review reported that the Cold War was over and Japan and Germany had won. In 1979, there was a widespread belief that the United States needed a fundamental change towards a parliamentary system because it was, in the words of the best-selling book of that day, Lester Thoreau's Zero Sum, uh, society. In John Kennedy was referenced. He believed throughout his presidency that there was a very good chance that the Soviet Union would have a larger economy than the United States did by, 1980, by 1985. In the late 1930s, it was believed that we would never come out of depression. 
Roosevelt rejected the advice of the intelligentsia of his day that he assumed dictatorial powers. So great were the problems on March 4th, 1933. And in 1791, Patrick Henry announced that the spirit of the revolution had already been lost. And so I think that it is actually part of the genius of the system that it has this capacity for self-denying prophecy of doom. And that's why people like all of us exist. And that's why centers like the Center for Business and Government exist. If there weren't any problems, there wouldn't be any need for centers. But there always are problems. And people never call attention to those problems by saying they're trivial. So they're always grave and serious problems. But they have a way of being worked through and being resolved. And of course, this moment has its elements of difference from every other previous moment of crisis. But I promise you, if you listened to the people in 1979, they thought this crisis of governance was entirely different than any previous crisis of uh, governance. And so I think some perspective on the fact that we are always gravely concerned is appropriate. I mean, it's a little bit like, I'm not that old, there are people here who are much older than I, but I have never been through a presidential election that was not a uniquely critical presidential election. <laughs> and I'm fairly confident that I never will live to see such an election. Yes, this is a grave and critical moment, but we will surmount it in ways that will enable us to deal with grave and critical moments for a long time to come. On that note, thank you all.